My name is uh, Xiang Jingwei. I'm a professor at the uh, Columbia Business School and director of the Jeremy A. Chazen Institute of International Business. On behalf of the Japan Center on, sorry, on behalf of the Center on Japanese Economy and Business, uh, CGIP, and APEC Center, and the Jeremy A. Chazen Institute of International Business, let me welcome you uh, here. Uh, today's event, a featured speaker is uh, Jung Wa <coughs> Lee, Chief Economist of Asian Development uh, uh, Bank. So, Asia, as you know, is leading the uh, way uh, in, in the recovery of the world economy, and Jung Wa is leading the way for oh. ADB's uh, <laughs> research and forecasting and various other activities. Uh, uh, Jung Wa's, uh, uh, in addition to being Chief Economist, is also the Director of its Economics and Research Department which uh, oversees its research, capacity building, and supports ADB uh, operation. Jung-Wa previously uh, headed uh, ADB's Office of International Regional Economic Integration from 2007 to 2009. Uh, Dr. Lee is a very um, accomplished uh, economist, ha uh, having uh, 20 years of professional experience, very, very long list of publications. Uh, um, his CV is very long, number two. Uh, repeat his official bio, but since I know uh, uh, Dr. Lee very well, I want to mention one thing that's not on his official uh, bio. As, as some of you know, the leading journal in the field of international economics is called Journal of International Economics, and Jung Wa's uh, article with uh, uh, Eduardo Borestin and uh, the Jose de Gregori, I guess, right, yeah. is, is one of the, the most downloaded papers <laughs> in the entire history of the journal. So very influential uh, uh, research is on the uh, role of foreign direct investment in economic uh, growth. In addition, uh, his many, many influential work. Another example of his influential work uh, is, uh, is his work on uh, human cap uh, measurement of human capital around the world, uh, uh, initially with uh, Professor Barrow, uh, Robert Barrow at, of Harvard University, and, uh, and the Barrow Lee data set is widely known uh, as such has been updated, and John Wa just told me the, the latest vintage has been updated to 2010. So those of you, those of you who need to work uh, with uh, human capital and data, so now you have a data uh, going all the way to uh, uh, 2010. So without further ado, let me turn to uh, Dr. Lee for uh, his uh, presentation on um, Asian economic outlook. Thank you, uh, thank you, Sam for your kind introductions and more importantly, the good advertisement of my own. And <coughs> lovely day outside, and uh, thank you very much for coming into the room. And uh, I'm very happy to be here to, to at the Columbia University to make a presentation about uh, ADB's major publication, which we call the Asian Development Hour of 2010, we call ADO. So in this presentation, I will just make the brief presentations and I would like to have Q&A with the people who are coming here during the lovely day to get some idea on the what's going on in, the, in Asia. I think it's the, I would like to focus on the two things. First of all, economic prospect. This will cover some our views on the global recovery and our forecast of the Asia's economic trend, not just this year, but over the next year. And then we'll address some issues related to the uh, risks to the outlook. So there are still significant risks to the Asia's uh, robust recovery. So I'll address those of the important risks. And then I'll go to the, some macroeconomic policy issues. Of course, I mean, the important issue is the so-called exit strategy. Because during the crisis time, Asian government mobilized the significant stimulus measures. The question is when and how they could withdraw these uh, exceptional stimulus measures. And that's the one question. But more importantly, whether Asia should go back to the uh, pre-crisis practice of the macroeconomic policies that includes the exchange rate policy, monetary policy, and fiscal policy, or they should make any new adjustment uh, to meet the challenges coming from the, this changing environment. So I, I, I'll go come back to the, these issues, but I would like to just summarize the uh, the main messages in this uh, presentation, just in case you should leave right after this uh, summary. Okay, first, we see that there are strong, robust uh, the, for the Asia's growth. There is some momentum, and we think it's uh, for the next two years, the growth 
will be the quite robust. Our focus for the Asia, we focus on the developing Asia. That means basically uh, 45 economies in the Asia and the Pacific, excluding the Japan. So it's the, our focus is 7.5%. This is the significant acceleration from the 5.2% Asia showed in 2009, and then 7.3% in 2011. So this is the a little low than the pre-crisis, historically high number of the 9.6% in 2007, but still quite substantially robust recovery. And now is the inflation pressures are increasing in the most of the Asian countries, but our view is the inflation are quite still manageable <coughs> in the most of countries. I will get back to this issue, so-called asset price global issues, in the, especially in the major Asian countries. Now the big question is the, what are the risks to the, this uh, relatively optimistic outlook? There are significant risks, mainly coming from the global uncertainty, but also coming from the very volatile capital flows in the Asian countries. So the question is, the, over the next two years, if you look at the mid-term, what are the challenges for the Asian countries? It's the same to the industrialized countries. Current recovery is the basically stimulated by the government. So government fiscal stimulus and monetary stimulus measures actually help to stimulate domestic demand. Then now government starts to withdraw the, this exceptionally, or exceptionally uh, expansionary monetary and fiscal stance, then what would happen to the demand side? So there should be robust private demand. So big question is the, how to shift source of growth from the government to the private sector. So this will be the fundamental challenge for the Asian countries. And then we will come back to the, this uh, monetary and fiscal policies issues. It's during the crisis time, basically sometimes people call this is a revival of the Keynesian economics. So there is the strong fiscal and monetary activism. Now we think is the Asian countries need to reaffirm its more prudent and disciplined monetary and fiscal policies. I'll come back to these policy issues again. But first, on the economic prospect side, let me just briefly explain the, our views on the global economy. We think of these global economies, especially the G3 economies, US, Eurozone, and Japan, uh, will show the mild recovery. So our forecast on average is the 1.7% in 2010 and the 2% in 2011. For the United States, 2.4% and 2011 is 26%, 2.6% and the Eurozone 1.1 and 1.6, Japan is 1.3 and 1.4. So it's the, here also the challenge is the, as the emergency measures start to withdraw, then the, what will happen to the private demand? I mean, this is the, also important <coughs> questions in the United States. Who, what would be the source of growth for the US, uh, US economy for the next couple of years? And uh, I'll just uh, go to the Asia side. By contrast, the Asia's recovery has been very strong, as I just explained. The Asia's economic revival will be very robust, 7.5% growth this year, and then 7.3% uh, growth in the 2011. There are, of course, there are challenges, but I think it's the Asia, we are quite optimistic about the Asian countries. Then the question is coming, how Asian countries managed to have this uh, strong recovery uh, in advance to the, to the industrial countries' recovery? This is going back to the, the well-known uh, question on the so-called decoupling uh, or recoupling or coupling. This is basically whether industrial countries uh, uh, economies uh, and, that, and the emerging Asian countries are linked together or not. I mean, so basically the, when uh, the industrial countries, especially U.S. economy got into the recession, what happened to the Asian countries? Clearly, I mean, during the crisis, this is the showing that there is a no decoupling. No decoupling means that basically Asian countries are still rely on the global financial markets and global trade. That's why the, during the uh, last quarter of the 2008 and then first quarter of the 2009, Asian countries got the severe hit from the, this uh, trade collapse and then the financial turmoil. So there is no, no doubt on that. But the question is, since then, what happened? Asian countries start to recover more quickly. So what are the sources of the, this recovery? And then whether this momentum 
will be maintained over the next two years. So this is the chart I tried to show the source of growth only from the domestic demand, or only domestic demand side. So I look at this. If you look at this uh, this component of the demand, which which contribute to the GDP growth, uh, GDP is coming from the from the demand side, export, there's external demand, net export, and there was government consumption, and the, and the private consumption, and also investment. If you look at the, this yellow block, it's the basically contribution of the investment. This is the important. If you look at the investment, what happened? Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, and Korea, all the significant negative investment contributed to the GDP growth. That means investment collapsed. So first, of course, it's coming from the inventory adjustment and these kind of things. What, what happened? Because those countries are very much export-oriented. So export-oriented industries are dominating the economy. So then once the world trade collapsed, they just cut all the investment. So export-oriented industries hit by the, this, uh, the, the trade collapse, and they cannot make the long-term investment. So this is what happens. So this is the investment is all negative. But look at the, the, the relatively large economy in the domestic market size. What happened to the China? Big positive component is coming from the domestic investment. And then India is also significantly positive yellow block size. And then if you look at the Indonesia, also still strong positive. So these are the basically domestic market are strong. Of course, it's not a really the private autonomous demand. It's also stimulated by government support, by, by cutting interest rate, by providing more liquidity, but also providing the fiscal stimulus. So these are the economies so basically explaining domestic markets are very important. So this crisis clearly explains that the economy will be very volatile if you only depend on the external demand. I'm not saying that the export orientation is bad. What I'm saying is the unbalanced structure of the economy is still create another risk to the, uh, the Asian countries. So also, if you look at the consumption side, consumption side is the green blocks. Actually, I just mentioned these uh, large economies. You can look at the China, India, and Indonesia, significantly positive. So those economies actually private uh, consumption maintain resilience. So this is the key. I mean, basically, if you, what happened into, into the economy from the labor market side, you can see the United States, of course, unemployment increased significantly and remained very elevated. But Asian countries, initial shock hit the export-oriented industries. So unemployment increased significantly. There is no new employment. But what happened to service sectors? Actually, if you look at over the year, Many countries, manufacturing sectors cut the employment, but service sectors increase employment. That's what happened in the Asian countries. So this is the experience basically during the crisis time, especially crisis coming from the external sectors. Domestic industry plays a very important role to maintain source of the growth. So this is the basically what happened to the Asian countries during the crisis time, 2009, on aggregate. And then you can see the actually the also role of the government. Of course, this government consumption, this is blue party is the also significantly positive in the Asian countries. So basically, the question is the, whether this domestic demand can be a source of growth. Especially the question is the external demand is recovering, but only very mildly, if based on the, our baseline scenario. Of course, there is the upside the risk and downside the risk. Global economies, US may recover very quickly or may not recover as, as we predicted or we may get into the another double dip. But our baseline is the mild recovery. So Asian countries cannot really rely on the external demand as, as, as a one source of the growth. They need another source of growth and that's the domestic demand. But the question is that this domestic demand is mainly driven by the government support. So if you look at the fiscal stimulus, actually some Asian, you can see the yellow is the basically between 2004 and 2008, that's the basically average uh, fiscal uh, balance 
And then fiscal balance deteriorated significantly because many Asian countries cut the taxes, increased the uh, <coughs> spendings. That's what happened to the Asian countries. So this, uh, this still we have, I get compared to this issue, uh, still they are very sound fiscal uh, conditions, but they cannot maintain this deteriorated fiscal stance for a while. I mean, you cannot contain the, maintain this uh, uh, current situations forever. So obviously the question is that if they start to withdraw government support, what will happen to the private demand, as I, I mentioned? Uh, I, I just mentioned uh, this uh, average uh, the performance of the Asian countries. Asia is also very diverse. There are, I explained, 45 economies. It started from the record Central Asia, former uh, Soviet Union um, the countries, uh, CIS, and also the Pacific Island. There are many countries in the Pacific. But if you look at the, in general, the trend is similar. It's a recovery, recovering quickly in the 2010, and then the, a little bit moderate in the 2011. I will not just go to the, this is a regional, but I'll just focus on the several countries in the, in the Asia. I'm not sure uh, if you come from the Asia, you want to try to pick up the, your home country. If I miss the, any countries, please look at the book. It has uh, all the list of the 45 countries. It just cut some countries, it's just based on the economic size. Let me start from the China, perhaps the, most in, uh, the largest and the most important countries, and then leading the recovery. Not just in Asia, but also in the global economy. They're very important countries. Our forecast is the 9.6% this year. So it's the, basically the, 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 a lot of favorable factors. External environment is becoming better. China still needs a strong export. Their net export is increasing. So that's the basically the, so good for the China. And the China mobilized the big scale of the fiscal stimulus measures. This is still uh, will be in effect this year. So they have called another momentum. So China's growth will be 9.6% this year. Next year, the 9.1%. India will lead the South Asia's growth. That's the second largest country in Asia. This the growth is the 8.2% uh, uh, to 2010. This is also coming from the strong government support. And also, the, it will be accelerated at 8.7% in 2011. <coughs> Uh, Korea is 5.2% uh, this year, 4.6% to 2011. I think uh, other countries like Indonesia also is a big country, the big populations, and uh, Indonesia, our forecast for Indonesia is 5.5%, uh, uh, and then 6% uh, there will be some acceleration to the 6% in the 2000, uh, 2011. I think it's uh, the Pakistan is the, we, our forecast is 3%. There are a lot of political uncertainty. So many countries actually have some uh, political uncertainties this year. So may, political development may have some impact on the economic performance. But our focus is the 3% for the uh, uh, Pakistan. And the Vietnam <coughs> GDP uh, growth is uh, projected to accelerate. So you can see the Vietnam is the 6.5% this year. And then next year, the 6.8%. Uh, Vietnam's case, actually, the, I'll just briefly mention the inflation side. Inflation pressure is the actually the now become accelerating. Our forecast the inflation uh, for the 2010 for the Vietnam is the 10 percent. So it's the even though Vietnam central bank already started tightening the uh, monetary policy, so it's a kind of like let me say the risk of the price instability in the Vietnam. So it's a big challenge. Is the many Asian countries, especially like Vietnam, is the how to maintain sustained economic growth. <laughs> and the macroeconomic stability together. That will be the challenge this year. And, uh, and Thailand, our forecast is the current is the 4% this year, and 4.5% uh, next year. OK, let, let me just briefly mention the inflation issues. This is the inflation forecast. Of course, last year, economic activities uh, operated below the full capacity. So it's the inflation pressures are completely subdued. But this year, inflation will, will pressure will increase as the recovery proceed, and then the also still there are significant uh, liquidity in the financial markets and also the, there will be the capital inflows but our focus for the region is the about four percent is the still stable uh, four percent is the is close to the historical average of course there are some countries as i said that are very high numbers but on general four percent are manageable and the next year is also similar to the 
uh, close to the 4%. So it will be all manageable. Another, another issue is the current account issues. I'll come back to the, this issue, focusing on the China. But uh, I think it's the current account surplus. That's basically trade and the goods and services and income account. So in terms of net terms, basically the Asia accumulated the surplus over time. But uh, historically, the high, it was very high in the 2007, 6.5% as a ratio to the re re region's GDP. But uh, it declined significantly this year. Uh, 2009, sorry, 2009, 4.9%. So it's a little bit declining. The Asian countries' the surplus has been declining, especially because of the big, uh, decline in the China's uh, current account uh, surplus. As a ratio to the China's GDP, I'll come back to this issue. Scale is important. So the question, question is, the, I just mentioned that the inflation is the maybe still manageable. And then the, the economic growth will be quite robust. This is the baseline, the, our forecast. And then the, we, we put in this uh, scenario. But there are still significant risks. Uh, many risks are coming from the global economy because the Asia is still rely on the external demand. So first, we see that this continued weakness in the US mortgage market is uh, still have a negative impact on the household consumption in the US and combined together with the high US unemployment, that will have a negative impact on the revival of the external demand for Asia's export. <coughs> and also the now industrial countries will start to withdraw the expansionary uh, monetary and fiscal policies. If the timing is bad, they may derail the, Asia, the global recovery. They also have a negative impact on the Asia's recovery. So, and also the, now is the, for example, this uh, fiscal crisis demonstrate that uh, this deteriorating fiscal positions could have a significant negative impact on the uh, global financial stability. So they may have the negative impact on the Asian countries. I'm not saying the Asian countries themselves have any fiscal problems at this stage, but all the financial markets are clearly uh, linked uh, and then this uh, linkage will play a very important role because the external financing is very important for Asian countries. Commodity prices, we see that oil prices will remain very stable, but not, not I should say, a little bit high, of, of course, compared to the crisis time, but between 80 and 85, it will remain stable. That's our uh, baseline forecast. Other, other commodity prices, especially the food price, were very important for the Asian countries. Uh, in 2008, actually, the significant increase in the food price actually created a lot of problems in the macroeconomic management and also hurt the uh, economic growth. So this year, we think it's the commodity price is just uh, will, will increase, but just following the speed of the economic recovery. But always there are uncertainties which may increase the commodity price significantly during the year that have, will have a uh, significant impact. Let me just, uh, I'll come back to this issue uh, uh, during the, the, the next uh, slide. But uh, in not just this year, but in the midterm, there are significant risks uh, coming from the so-called persistent global payment imbalances. I'll come back to this issue. And the international policy coordination is especially uh, this week, there will be the G20 finance ministers meeting, which is focusing on the coordination of the financial regulations. Basically, this crisis demonstrated that uh, any turmoil in the industrial countries will have spillover effect to the emerging economies. So how to maintain this stability in the global financial system is important. So and then global crisis require global cooperation. So how to achieve this uh, global cooperation is important. Not just coming out from the, this crisis, more important to prevent the next crisis. So we'll see I mean, the, what will be the policy coordinations. I'll come back to the regional policy coordinations among the Asian countries. This is also important issue to the Asia. Uh, two issues are very important for Asia currently. This uh, increasing asset price, risk of the asset price bubbles, and also volatile capital <coughs> flows. Okay. I'll get to this issue right, right away. OK, first issue is the US mortgage market issues. I think it's the, in the March numbers, uh, and check, it's a little bit better but still significantly high uh, delinquency ratios. Uh, so the household cannot repay the 
or the force of the commercial uh, commercial firms cannot repay these uh, mortgage loans. So they may have hurt the balance sheet of the uh, the financial institutions. So this will, act, as I explained, I mean, have negative impact on the household consumptions, also business sentiment, and it's also the unemployment. High unemployment is another issue. This is the so-called global current account imbalances. If you look at the, this uh, spatial chart, is the showing that uh, which countries are accumulating current account deficit, and who are accumulating current account surplus. Of course, I mean you can see the a lot of the big contribution is coming from the United States. There is no doubt. This pink block is the contribution of the U.S. as a ratio to the world GDP. So U.S. is contributing the major component of the world